What's going on, everyone? My name is Nicholas Merton here at Datadash, and today is February 7th of 2019. Well, folks, I hope you all are having a great day wherever you are. And today we've got a good range of topics to discuss for both crypto and traditional markets. Starting off diving into crypto, we'll not only be taking a look at market valuations, but also we'll be discussing a key indicator that I like to keep an eye on, and that is the short positions on Bitfinex and how we can gain some insight from it. And last but not least, taking a look at the current situation with Quadriga CX and understanding what we know. Outside of that, though, for traditional markets, we'll learn about why JP Morgan believes we need to be taking on more risk and equities, how one of the largest bank mergers is about to happen from the last decade, and we're also going to be discussing, as requested, URA in uranium markets. So we've got lots of things to discuss. Let's not push it off any longer and dive right in to the update. Now, I do want to let you all know I will be speaking at NEO DevCon. If you guys are interested, please definitely register for tickets. And along with that, if you're a student, you can actually potentially get a free ticket. So check out the link down below in the description. It'll lead you right towards the forum where you can actually go about applying for a free ticket. But I'd love to see you guys. So if you could come out, it'd be really awesome. Not to mention they're going to have a lot of awesome speakers there. Alrighty, so taking a look over markets over the last 24 hours, most altcoins following in the green here with a few players in the red as Bitcoin has remained quite neutral and slightly in the green. Again, no serious moves though as we take a look over the past few hours. Volatility is pretty much non-existent at the moment and market cap has really not moved that much. Again, we're still about $10 billion away from our double bottom target at $100 billion. So I think we're going to have that good 10% wipe and from there we could really start to see some moves up to the upside. This doesn't mean that I think all altcoins are going to start to lose dramatically to Bitcoin. Some will lose dominance. I think it's going to be some of the larger players because that's where the real big moves have been coming in, is at least in the sense of the valuation that they hold. But in regards to Bitcoin dominance, we're not that far away from our target at around 54 to 54.5%, just about another percentage point to go in this case. So again, still waiting for this to happen. And instead of focusing so much on Bitcoin's price, I think we all know we're about $200 away from getting that double bottom, 200, 250. You know, it really depends on what exchange rate you're looking at. The one thing that I really want to talk about is the BTC USD shorts. So these are the short positions that are registered on Bitfinex, and it can give us a good window as to how much uh, you know weight is coming in uh, from the market and what the market is gauging in regards to going long or short. And this is actually quite a contrarian indicator because when you tend to find that the shorts are low in this case, it's usually a time where you can get more confident or at least when they're declining, it's it's a time usually I uh, just start getting more bullish in this case. But when we, we take a look at where we are now, shorts are actually quite low in this market. And as price has actually been declining from 4,000, we haven't seen a steady increase. This has actually been quite marginal comparative to the moves that shorts usually make. So I think as we start to pile in price action to the downside, I think you're going to start to see shorts bump up here you get into a higher range, but I don't think you're going to test back up to 38,000. And in fact, I think we're going to test a range here around 30,000. Uh, right here in this mid-range, we've seen this test in multiple times here. And it usually tends to hit some resistance around 30,000 to 3250, or excuse me, 32,500. And from there, I think you're going to get a really big short squeeze coming in from the double bottom. And that's what you want to see. Not to mention, you've also got another technical pattern building up for the longs here. And as you can see here, uh, we're getting resistance from this line. And I think what you're going to get is a bump down as we start to test, uh, again, retest those lows. A lot of longs are going to get liquidated. It's going to come back down to 29,000 here. And then we'll have a breakout through it and possibly test back up here to the highs. Again, with people coming in, starting to trade on margin, trading off the hype of the rally. So that's what I'm looking for at the moment, guys. I'd love to hear what you all think down below. I think a double bottom is very practical at this point. You know, and especially with Bitcoin dominance setting up on that three time line of resistance, basically where we're getting lower highs each time, it tells me that markets might be ready for a little bit of bottom trading, a little bit of risk taking. So I'm interested to see that. Going on to the news though, guys, I want to talk about Quadriga CX. Now I won't have all of the time to talk about everything that's in this article. This is probably uh, one of the best articles I've seen at a CoinDesk in a while, just summarizing this very complex situation. Uh, and I'll, I'll definitely, you know, guys, you guys, guys can go check out the article yourselves. We recommend you definitely look into it if you want to get some more details, and especially if you're someone who had their money on Quadriga CX. But I want to talk about some of the main things here. Uh, some of the uh, news that we have on the current situation, uh, some good news, but also get diving in a little bit into the conspiracies uh, in regards to the CEO. So we've got a few different things to discuss. Let's go ahead and talk about the current news of the situation. So we do know officially that Quadriga CX over the next few weeks is going to owe a lot of money. 
approximately around $190 million uh, worth of original cryptocurrency assets. So this is definitely one of the biggest uh, Western exchange hacks that we've had in a very long time. Uh, I think it's on par, you know, it's definitely not on par with, uh, you know, Mt. Gox or anything of that severity. But this is definitely going to have a huge weight on Canadian adoption of cryptocurrencies, I think, more than anything. And I know a lot of people personally who've gotten hit by this and are waiting to hear whether or not they're going to get some form of compensation from this hack, seeing as Quadruta CX is on the hook. Now, there is some good news here in regards to the fact that... Um, not only does Quadriga CX own a lot of money, not all of its funds are in crypto, obviously. So a lot of the money that they held was in cash. Uh, this goes through a variety of different things. Uh, for example, some of their lawyers, some of the third-party processors, their banking partners. You can see there's a variety of other different areas where they have cash in this case. So it's good to see that not everything is lost and potentially what we might see if it turns out that uh, crypto has been lost, that they're probably going to do what I think Bitfinex did back a few years ago when they had their exchange hack, which is like, hey, look, we don't want to be unfair to certain customers who had crypto on our exchange. So what we'll do is take some of this cash and distribute it amongst those who have lost funds and basically uh, play it out evenly for anyone who had money dealt with the exchange. I think that's a probable case that could come into play. But again, it's not the favorable one. I hope that they actually get held, uh, you know, there's some sort of obligation and or some kind of reimbursement outside of just that. I think that would be quite a uh, quite a poor choice, just simply leaving it at that. I think it'd be fair in that sense, but at the same time, again, having a better, uh, better route than that would be much better. So outside of this, guys, this is some of the good news, though. At least there is some cash in the books. We do know that Quadriga CX owes a lot of money. The thing I want to talk about is really the CEO, because this is where all the mysteries come in, the supposed owner of the keys, and supposedly an individual who's now dead, uh, who had died in India. So uh, the CEO, Cotton, here basically has been getting all of the, the traction here, I think, really on this topic, because people are really wondering whether or not he's dead. If he is the sole owner of the keys, uh, if he's dead, we really may never get access to this keys. But if he's alive, if this is really all just a ruse and someone trying to exit scam, then it might be that there's a chance to get the keys and the keys still may be out there. Now, um, let's go ahead and talk about some of the sketchy things that have happened. We already know about a lot of the things we mentioned in the last video. Um, for example, the, the fact that they used Kraken to actually <laughs> store a lot of their funds and uh, do deal with a lot of uh, you know transactional business for the exchange. And along with that as well, how they've gone all the way, uh, the CEO uh, actually died in India. This is probably the another big red flag there. The thing is the Indian CEO, or the, the CEO who died in India, died in an area and has his death certificate from an area that is very commonly known for instilling fake death certificates, okay? So the red flags are showing up everywhere. And another one that many people haven't mentioned that I've, I've heard from some consumers, but they haven't really put it out there as a red flag is that Quadriga CX was a, a pretty terrible exchange and it wasn't improving as a business, right? So when you tend to find this, guys, this is something that's very important, especially in businesses that deal with your money. If you don't see improvements being made and they don't have a long standing reputation, that should be a very worrying sign. And the reason I say this is because take a look at exchanges like Coinbase uh, and, and other ones, for example, that have built up uh, Gemini, I think, for, as an example as well, always making new updates, always trying to improve their exchanges. And even though they're not perfect, they're always showing you that, look, we're in this for the long term, right? We have an incentive to stay in this for the long term because that's our goal. We want to be one of the major mainstream exchanges for cryptocurrencies, whereas Quadri CX and a lot of other exchanges do not improve. Notice how Cryptopia really didn't make much improvements over the past few years. Exchange hack. I mean, it's like it's the same kind of pattern where it shows two things. They're either not really trying to stand out in the long term or B, they really don't have long term interests. And I think that plays a role into this. I think it's a very important perspective to take into account. Now, again, do we have any proof that he's alive, guys? No, we don't. And, you know, the lack of information we're working with right now leaves us kind of flustered. Uh, but the, the thing that to take away more than anything here is that this should be a major lesson to be learned from. 
right? Uh, you know, I, I'm not even someone, I almost complain sometimes when people just continuously shout, not your keys, not your Bitcoin. Because I think uh, sometimes people are overselling the idea that everyone needs to become their own bank. And that's not the case. Not everyone has to be their own bank. But you need to trust those with good reputation, with a reputation that has long lasted, uh, long superseded other exchanges. And again, has the business incentive to take care of it. Similar to how we think about those who you know, we think, for example, about incentive mechanisms and game theory mechanics in relations to consensus for Bitcoin. You know, what's going to provide the best incentive for the safety of your funds, right? We trust third parties in a lot of things in our lives. But I will say, if you have the ability to simply use exchanges when you need them and get the funds off and keep it in a cold storage wallet, that is the best move you can do. But again, I'm not trying to, you know, play Captain Hindsight here, guys. For those of you who have lost money through Quadriga, I'm really sorry about it. And hopefully there will be some resolution, whether it's fiat, um, you know, reimbursement. I know that's not as cool as crypto. But along with that as well, um, I hope that this is brought to justice if he is still alive. And I hope the investigation uh, succeeds in what they're aiming to uh, achieve in this case. So... Anyways, going on though, let's go ahead and talk about traditional markets. So JP Morgan is saying that we need to be taking more risk. <laughs> we need to be taking more risk and unwind those hedges. I love that. <laughs> That's such a good way to say it. Just unwind those hedges a little bit. Start start, you know, you know, drinking from the punch bowl again. So there's really two major points here uh, that JP Morgan made. And I'll I'll actually say there's parts that I agree with and some that I disagree with. On a fundamental level, uh, it, JP Morgan really focuses on the fact of what I talk about all the time. The rules are changing. The Fed has stopped raising rates. They stopped last month. They didn't raise rates. And along with that, they've talked about reversing rates if need be. Not to mention reversing the balance sheet. So now we're in the twilight zone. We're not raising rates, uh, being hawkish by any means. And we're also not pulling the lever back, right? We're, we're not lowering things just yet. We're in the twilight zone. We need to see what the Fed's going to do. And... The thing I'd say is that uh, we're not at the point where I would be so uberly confident that, yes, it's time to take risk in equities because you still have an interest rate that's much higher than it was a few years ago. So the cost to borrow capital is higher. Um, you know, businesses that can't, uh, who need to borrow capital, who can't maintain a profit margin above the, uh, the interest rate that they're lending or they're borrowing from the bank in big trouble there. So some businesses are still going to fail in this case, uh, even with a, a growing economy. It's just basic monetary. Uh, it's just it's basic finance in this case, basic finance and economics. But going on here, they do also do mention uh, that they recommend going long U.S. stocks sensitive to China trade in this case. So the, the China trade deal and everything. And I'd say uh, not so much just China trade. I would say I would want to trade on companies that have been blocked down. This is a point that I think I wasn't very clear on in my last video. I would want to bet on companies that would benefit greatly in regards to China's violations of IP. And what I mean by that is not just the extra revenue that these businesses will generate if they can finally start getting the respect to their intellectual properties they deserve, meaning that they're going to get paid and, and benefit the fruits from the developments that they've created. But more importantly, that competing U.S. services will be able to operate in China. So instead of China's alternative to Uber, Uber could actually start competing in China. Um, you know, I'm just listing that as an example, but a variety of tech companies, letting tech companies actually migrate into the United States and do business there instead of Baidu being the Google of China. And this is something that I think China is not going to let up easy, but I think this is really what objectively is trying to get negotiated in the trade deal because this will reduce the deficit. This will reduce it. We don't need to always manufacture and sell goods and services. We're a tech-based economy. Uh, and this is where I think, uh, I think they're going to try to fi fill the gap in this case. And really try to get some benefits out of this negotiation between uh, the U.S. and China. So uh, in this case, again, I, I absolutely agree that uh, we should focus in this case on the China-U.S. trade deal and what that could potentially entail if we really start to get some of those really beneficial perks uh, if, we can, if we can negotiate it with China. And that would make it a hugely successful trade deal in that case. But... I'd say that in regards to taking on a lot of risk because the Fed isn't raising rates, I wouldn't do that because we're A, near the line of resistance here in regards to equities, and along with that as well, we've already had plenty of relief coming to equities. I think a lot of this has already been priced in. Once we had the sell-off, I bet many people already priced in that the Fed would stop raising rates. Not to mention, we had so many artificial things keeping up the market. Remember the pension buybacks, or the pension um, restructuring that cost $64 billion in purchasing power for equities, and along with that, the global central bank balance sheet raising up. 
right? If we see the U.S. follow suit with other central banks and continue uh, the repurchase of assets and or uh, the lowering of interest rates, then of course, guys, remember I've always told you, play by the rules. It might seem stupid. It might seem like the same old Ponzi that's kept up markets for the last 10 years. But hey, don't argue with the guys. Don't play by the rules. That's the biggest thing I can tell you. You know, understand what fundamentally keeps up markets, what fundamentally keeps them down, and follow with what's happening, right? It's it's not too overcomplicated. Uh, and, and, you know, in that case, when, when markets are continuously buying financial assets and they're continuously lowering interest rates on those dips, you know, it's it's by the dip. That's that's the whole thing that everyone's been saying. Now, of course, I'm not recommending you guys do anything, but that's been my philosophy for the past few years, and it, it worked. And then when things started to change, when the global central bank balance sheet started going downward, 2018, for example, we started to see global equities, especially those outside the United States, really taking a hit. So, again, very important thing to take away. Uh, and also, they mentioned shift away from gold and go to industrial metals. I think industrial metals are fine, uh, but I really don't think they're going to do that well if China is slowing. And I think in this case, gold is, is still going to be growing. It broke out of a very long-term channel, so I would not ignore that. Going on to talk about the recent bank acquisition, BB&T and SunTrust have come together in a merger that is a multi-billion dollar deal, and not to mention that, but along with it, it is the largest deal we've had in the last decade for a bank merger. So this is continuing with the trend that we saw back in 2008 during the financial crisis where banks conglomerized and became even larger. Not to mention, this is going to create the sixth largest bank in the United States. Now, BB&T, SunTrust, uh, I don't really like banks in general, but these are re relatively respectable banks. Uh, they're, they're actually close to home, seeing as I'm on the East Coast. But the whole thing about it that worries me more than anything is the continued increase um, in the uh, too big to fail narrative, right? These banks becoming uh, more and more narrow in the sense of at least the choices that we have. There's no competition. Um, you know, when you had a mixture of small and medium banks, you actually had competition, competition for your business to provide a better experience, to provide better interest rates. Nowadays, you just got a few major banks. Uh, this is a good chart. Uh, I'm sad I haven't been able to find like an updated version of this, but it shows how in 2009 there was a major, major um, consolidation of banks. I remember a lot of these banks. Wa Wachovia, First Union, coming down all the way into Wells Fargo. Uh, Bank of America picking up a lot of big com uh, uh, companies. Merrill Lynch, Countrywide Financial, uh, U.S. Trust, MD uh, MBNA. I mean, these are these used to be common names. Washington Mutual, Citigroup. Uh, you know, acquiring a major amount of banks here. So, again, as we continue to start to narrow in and get that too big to fail narrative, that really worries me because it's not going to be a few smaller, medium-sized banks that fail next time. It's going to be half if not the majority of the banking system. If one or two of these dominoes fall or this new merger between SunTrust and BB&T, that's gonna be very worrisome for the economy. Again, I wish all the best in the merger. I, I hope more than anything that this doesn't lead to a lot of layoffs as mergers tend to, but more than anything, uh, you know, if it reduces inefficiencies and cuts costs and provides a better experience for the consumer, I'm good for that as well. So we'll have to see. Uh, you guys know I, I generally have a negative view on banks for the most part. Alrighty, so going on here, let's go ahead and talk about something I haven't talked about in the past few updates, and there was no reason for it. I just ha I happened to feel that I was talking too much about URA, and I thought people weren't interested in the commodities that much, but it seems like you guys were. I got some comments worried about it, so nonetheless, I will be talking about it today. Now, URA, uh, I I'm very excited about the fact that we did break out of the long-term wedge. It's been a two-year wedge that this was built into, and we finally broke out of it. Now, equally justifiable as well, and important to point out, important to point out, is that we had two times where we did actually break below the line, but we got back into it. Uh, again, I think it was the market realizing that this is going to get weighed a little bit by what's happening in the equity space because these are really, uh, this ETF is a, a broad measurement of different equities, some of which do small aspects or business practices in the uranium sector. Some of them aren't directly just miners. So you're going to get some fluctuations with this. But nonetheless, I think people recognize that we held support here on the line. This is one of my favorite things when you can see a nice level of support on the previous line of resistance. So you've now turned it into support, and then you have a break in price. So to those of you who have uh, followed the trade as we talked about, which was when we break above this line, you're definitely up on your money a little bit. 
good to hear about that. Now, in the longer term, what I want to see is that I want to see this RSI come down as we hit the overbought range just the other day, and I want to see this hold on this 200 day. And it could be very quick that we come down and test it and rebound back off. Really depends, I think, on what happens in equity markets. Because right now, the uranium space, even though I am optimistic on it in 2019, 2019 is a long year, guys. And what I need to see is I need to see an increase in the spot price for uranium. If you go to Google and you look up Cameco uranium price, you'll see that we're still sitting around, I think, $29 per pound, if not $30. Uh, and we need to really have a break above $30, like a, a solid three to five dollar increase per pound on uranium to really spark an uptrend and to signal that we've not only bottomed in the market that we're ready to make higher levels and that demand is rising now supply cuts are really going to be the help in this regard uh, but you know again we have to see that reflected in the actual spot price you know there's been the huge cuts with Kazata prom you know cameco cutting its largest plant down i think these are going to have some pretty dramatic effects on the price but it takes a few months for these to actually come into the equation so they've been in the works for a few months now and maybe we could see something going into the later part of quarter one if not quarter two of 2019 so it's a slow steady process you're not going to definitely see this mooning like crypto but ura as we've seen can make some very nice jumps in the right time periods right so very important to watch that and again there's a variety of other miners there's a uec that you can keep an eye on as well uh all kinds of really great companies and stuff that you can watch and we actually saw uec had a big breakout the other day i think again i think following on with ura in this case so there's a lot of cool miners you can watch do some research take a look into them i, I talked about some in my commodities investing video but uh, I think it's a topic over the next week or so that we'll talk about. We need to see it testing on some of this key support. Going on, though, let's go ahead and take a look at gold and silver. Gold doing exactly what it needs to do, coming back on the line of previous resistance and making it support. Hopefully it holds here for the next two or three days and it starts to curve up. That's exactly what I want to see. So far, it's playing fine. Going on to silver. Right here, we can see that we're holding on this line of support. I want to see a continued uh, hold on this and then hopefully move higher. Really, the next range of resistance I see for silver is up here at 1720 to 1730, which is a nice, decent distance for silver. And, uh, you know, I might consider doing a leverage trade on this, uh, you know, trading like 2 or 3x leverage on silver. But that's just me personally. And then also we'll take a look real quick at the overall equities market. SP 500 getting rejected at the 200 day, turning over here, starting off uh, a negative turn for February. Actually, sorry, I apologize. We actually are still technically a little bit up for February, at least on the S&P. And then on the NASDAQ as well, turning over here. Uh, even though we have gotten above the line of resistance for the NASDAQ, which is a little bit more towards the downside, giving the bulls a little bit of uh, uh, room here in order to decline. What I'm waiting for is if whether or not this breaks below this line here, right? This is the key thing that I'm watching. And in the S&P 500, again, the line of resistance is actually quite straight here. It's at around 2,800 on the index, which is, again, similar to the resistance range we saw over here and over here and what was turned support over here. So it's a very key range here for the S&P 500. And it looks like right now we aren't able to get above there and are turning back over. So I keep an eye on those two indicators, not to mention the fact that on pretty much the NASDAQ and the S&P, we were close to being overbought, if not in the same range here where we tend to continue to see resistance on the S&P 500 since all the way back in 2018. We haven't got any dramatic overbought nature, and the reason being is because markets are dovish right now, and central bank policy is not favoring overbuying equities. The only time people are buying equities is when it's dramatically oversold, right? So again... Not the time period where I'd expect to get bullish, guys. And that's, again, going back to the, the points from JP Morgan. It's probably not the best time, at least in the next week or so, to really take risk until we get some better prices in the market and better confirmation that the Fed isn't just talking and isn't just balancing between trying to keep the dollar up and trying to satisfy equity markets. That's what the Fed's trying to do right now. They're trying to create a, a balance of, of happiness between both markets. And it all has to do with that core principle of monetary policy. So anyways, that's it for the video, guys. Thank you so much for watching. If you guys enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up down below and leave a comment as to what you all think about the topics we discussed. I'd love to hear what you all think in regards to crypto markets as well as traditional markets. But until the next video, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one. Stay tuned.